Well, good evening, YouTube. The time has come for me to make a video documenting this Adams Bagnall lamp. And I'm, I'm just too lazy and, and computer illiterate to learn how to edit videos. And a video is better than no video. So some of you might know that about a year ago, I did have some videos on these carbon arc lamps operating, and I screwed up big time because in these videos, I did not discuss the risks with running these, and I had three people over a course of a year message me, hey, I saw your video, and it looked really easy. I plugged my lamp in, and after a few minutes, it started burning and I destroyed some components. I had three people message me that. And uh, I realized that in all my videos, I didn't discuss the risks. I didn't point out the inherent dangers. And um, unless you have a very intrinsic knowledge of electrical machinery, troubleshooting it and uh, how things work, these stupid lamps are a lot more archaic and have a lot of idiosyncrasies that over the you know, 15 years or so I've been collecting these things that I've had time to figure out through trial and error, which is the worst, and just talking to other collectors. So when these arc lamps came out in about 1885 to 1910, there wasn't really any standardization in electrical distribution. Uh, you had alternating current, and then you had direct current, and uh, AC circuits ran with... God knows what frequency. There's some, hertz, which is the time in every second that it switches direction. Uh, you had anywhere between 25 hertz to 30 hertz to 45 to 50 to 60 to 133 to 166, etc. So a lot of people, and I, I, I'm going to have to be very careful with what I say, a lot of people, when they see alternating current on these arc lamps, on eBay, on Facebook, whatever, that does not mean it's 60 hertz, okay? If you plug a lamp designed for 133 hertz, 45 hertz, 25, well, actually, no. There wouldn't be any arc lamps at that low of a frequency because they just simply wouldn't run. Arc lamps were designed for high-frequency circuits, such as 133 hertz, 166, and 233, because 60 hertz was just not suitable to run these things. It, it chatters, it hammers the carbons, and they usually, these power companies, had separate circuits devoted to arc lamps that were very high-frequency alternating current. So what, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? So when you get an AC lamp, it will run. On, it will most likely run on 60 hertz, but the choke coil on it, the inductor, will overheat and it'll melt the windings. The solenoids on it will get hot because they're not designed to run on 60 hertz. They'll run fine for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, but any more than that, they're going to get really hot and they're going to melt the insulation on there, okay? Unless you can design a power supply that spits out the... Uh, the, the hertz requirement on these arc lamps, you're going to damage it. You're going to overheat the coils. You're going to catch it on fire. You're going to melt the windings. And I'm speaking from experience, and I hate to say that, but I, I have screwed up a lamp. It was an Adams Bagnall lamp that I left unattended and, uh, you know, had it hanging out and running. And, and then I come back and it stops running and the inductor was fried because it got so hot but, you know, just, just a warning out there. You don't just get one of these off an auction site and you plug it in, you take it apart. And honestly, I feel like that's outside the scope of this video because without, without, no, without putting the effort into learning how to, to edit videos, there's so many things that can go wrong with these things. You buy it off an auction site and the coils might be shorted out. Your solenoid coils might be shorted out. Your inductor might be shorted out. There could be a case ground on it that's... that's shorting out. If you don't know how to use a multimeter and how to use resistance testings 
or take this thing apart, thoroughly break these lamps apart and look at them and test the components, you are going to damage something. Just because it says AC current doesn't mean you can plug it in. You will damage something. Okay, so that's enough of me running my mouth about a warning. So here's a good example. This is an Adams Bagnell lamp. These are the most common arc lamps besides GE lamps. The reason they're so common is that they were, number one, they were the most common arc lamp during their time period. And secondly, a lot of people saved these things because they're really pretty looking. They've got these ornate fluted casings and a lot of people thought they looked neat. And they most likely stashed it in an attic or some kind of storage building. So that's one of the reasons these things are so common. Every year on eBay, there's usually two to four or five of these things that sell uh, in various degrees of completion. Um, with, with these videos and also the Facebook Carbon Arc Lamp Restoration and Selling Group creating more awareness, uh, a lot of people have realized that, hey, these arc lamps are cool. So what I would like to do in this video is discuss some basic operating principles and also how to discern between alternating current lamps and direct current lamps and their various different subtypes. I'm not going to discuss the subtypes of these lamps. I'm not going to discuss flaming arc lamps. I'm not going to discuss luminous magnetite arc lamps, and I'm not going to discuss regenerative arc lamps. What I'm going to discuss is your basic DC lamps and your AC lamps, but those series arc lamps, luminous, magnetite, regenerative, they're all outside of the scope of this video, and I'm... <laughs> Unless I get some of those that are in good operating condition, which 90% of these you get on eBay, they're going to be missing parts, they're going to be damaged, or get, they are just such a pain in the ass to fix. I, I, have, I, I have got a very, very small quantity of arc lamps, and I probably will never have all of them restored in my entire lifetime. So, anyway, this is an alternating current Adams Bagnall lamp. This is one of the later generation ones, which I suspect came out after 1908 and was very quickly discontinued in probably 1912 or 13. And I'm going to take a look at the outside components and then take a look at the inside and point out some various different things to help you discern between AC and DC lamps. And lastly, I will put some voltage on it and fire it up. So. This particular Adams Bagnell lamp has the standard globe holder ring. This is not the outside version that, uh, well, the outside and inside versions could use the ornate scalloped globe holder ring. This is the very basic globe holder ring that would typically be used on an outside lamp as you had it hanging up, but they're, they're completely interchangeable. It has a factory original finish on here. This is some type of black copper oxidation. If you find an Adams Bagnell lamp that's been polished to a uh, shiny brass, that has been damaged. The factory original finish has been removed. I will make a separate video on finishes on these Adams Bagnall lamps, but they were never ever available in a polished brass finish. They were never available in a copper polished finish, ever. That has been damaged. You had the streaked black oxidation right here. You had the dark oxidized copper, which is a, I have a shell of one of those somewhere. And then you had a black Japan color, which is basically a black, uh, black coating that was available on steel and copper lamps. But it's the Japaning would be uh, just like this without the, uh, at the factory, they removed some of the coating and uh, exposed the logos on there for a very attractive ornate finish. And moving on to the top, we can see our, this cap right here underneath it has a screen that allows convection to remove some of the heat in the fixture. And then of course here are your two terminals marked positive and negative or P and N respectively which would discern between your source, your line, and your 
your uh, neutral point on an alternating current system. So we can open this door. It has this very ornate little handle that you can turn to open the door. And then of course our nameplate right here has a very late serial number. And you can see that it's manufactured by the Adams Bagnell Electric Company of Cleveland, Ohio with some various different patent numbers. Opening the door, we have, and, and this is very uncommon for these Adams Bagnell lamps, but this particular one is marked AC multiple. The line voltage is 110 volts AC. At the arc, you want 75 volts. It pulls seven amps on the primary side. And look at that. The cycle is 133 cycles. This lamp is not designed to operate on 60 hertz unless, uh, unless you're willing to overheat the inductor and the solenoid coils. However, for 10 to 15 minutes, this lamp will run. But uh, I, I'm just throwing that out there. I see so many people on all of these online groups running these lamps say, thinking they're fine to run on 60 hertz. But no, you have to do it very cautiously or you will overheat this lamp and you will damage it. Looking at the inside components, this is an AC lamp as pointed out. On AC carbon arc lamps, typically the lifting coils are going to be made, and let's see if I can get a good shot of this. Those lifting coils are going to be made of laminated sheets of metal to, to lessen the, the heat induced by the Henry, the uh, eddy currents. DC models will typically have a solid lifting coil. But on this particular lamp, if I can get my godforsaken phone to focus, it's going to be laminated sheets of metal. I can't really get a good, get a good viewpoint on that. But uh, those lifting, the lifting mechanism is going to be made of laminated sheets of metal. So when you turn this on, on this Adams Bagnell lamp, this coil gets sucked up. And what that does is there is a clutch mechanism made of a porcelain disc which lifts the rod. I'm going to take this outer globe off and I'm going to better focus on that so you can see kind of how that mechanism works. But when you turn it on, that lifting coil comes up and it pulls the upper carbon up, striking the arc and adjusting it to the appropriate gap. On the solenoid coils, we have various different taps. On the very bottom, on the very bottom, is the least amount of inductance. The middle is medium, and then on the very end is the most amount of inductance. Why would you want to change the inductance on the solenoid coils? Well, simply put, to adjust the voltage at your arc. The ideal operating voltage on your arc is anywhere between 73, 72 to 75 volts for maximum efficiency. You undo these screws and change where this lead wire goes on these solenoid coils to adjust and tune your arc values. On alternating current lamps, on the very top is going to be a wound inductor. The inductor, here's another one that I have that had to be repaired because somebody damaged it and they sent it to me. The inductor has various different taps. You can adjust the lead wires on these taps in order to change the voltage at the arc. All right? Let me take this globe off and I'm going to better show you how the lifting clutch mechanism on this Adams Bagnell lamp works. On the globe ring, we have a handle here. We pull this down and away and it has various different positions on this holding ring. And then once you remove that, this hook comes out of this loop mechanism here. Most of the time on this screw connected to this eyelet, there's going to be a chain the one that I have is removed for the sake of simplicity. So let me see if I can remove this globe without, without damaging it. I don't have the original globe on here. This is a reproduction globe for obvious reasons. So I'm taking the globe ring off. Let me uh, focus on the components on here so you can get a better idea of how these details are. You can see that cast and riveted hook mechanism there that goes into this eyelet right here. And then on the other side is the notched cast piece that goes into the attachment ring. All right, so we'll open it back up. I'm pulling up 
on the lifting ring, but you can see the clutch here. It cocks the clutch at an angle, that porcelain disc. It cocks it at an angle. Let me move my flashlight up here so you can better see that. It cocks that porcelain disc at an angle, and what it does is it binds up the carbon and lifts it up. When the solenoid coils are released and the clutch lays flat, it drops the carbon. So when the when the when the carbons are burnt up and it breaks the arc and breaks the flow of current and releases the lifting coil, the carbon just falls down. It's an ingenious method invented by Charles Brush, which is one of the most simplistic, most effective, and reliable clutch mechanisms out there. That's one of the reasons these Adams Bagnell lamps were so popular. Adjusted for inflation. Each one of these lamps back in about 1900 was $24 to $32, which you adjust that for inflation, is about $2,000. One of the things that I have not touched on this video is that uh, arc lamps initially were the very first source of electric light. However, carbon filament light bulbs were available. They just simply did not output the amount of lumens and they did not output the white light that arc carbon arc lamps were outputting. A lot of people say that arc lamps were before light bulbs, which is partially correct. However, for about 10 to 15 years, arc lamps did coexist besides incandescent carbon filament bulbs and were the preferred source of light for street lighting because they output more light and they output a quality white bright light that was most the most similar to sunlight all right on your enclosed arc lamps or arc lamps that used uh, an enclosing globe like this to keep the air the oxygen off the carbons the carbons would last anywhere between five to seven days 150 to 200 hours which is roughly 24 hour service during nighttime is about five to seven days like i said and uh, you had somebody a trimmer that would come by and they would remove the bottom globe and they would swap out the carbons and renew them. That was actually a profession that many people did. It was one of the biggest costs with running arc lamps. So we've seen the inside components of this Adams Bagnell lamp. I've briefly discussed some of the operating principles and um, what I'd like to do now is plug this thing in and you can see and hear what this alternating current lamp sounds like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut the, the door, the service door right there. And then I'm going to put the globe on there and put some voltage on this thing. So let's see if I can hold this without breaking my, my globe. These, these globes, if, if you buy them online, are about $200 to $300 for new ones. So, uh, you know, they're not too terribly hard to find. But uh, let me... Let me shut this thing and uh, you can see and hear what this thing sounds like. So let me get my little wall outlet and my extension cord here and ready this thing to fire up. Turn my flashlight off, see if I can figure out where the plug's gonna, oh gosh, I can't see anything. <laughs> All right, so I wish I had this thing on a switch. All right, so try to aim my phone where the magic's going to happen. All right. In three, two, one. Okay, so the noise that you hear is the 60 hertz uh, frequency in the inductor and the vibrations in the solenoid coil. If this was a DC lamp, you wouldn't hear any of that. It would be completely silent. And uh, if you look, you can kind of capture it on my uh, white wall here. There's a, a, a purple line. That is ultraviolet radiation. And uh, inevitably, some dumbass is going to make some comment like, oh my god, ultraviolet radiation. Well, I appreciate 
the concern for sure, but luckily borosilicate glass filters out 95% of that ultraviolet radiation. So let me, uh, let me get some welding goggles here and see if we can see the arc there. Well, that doesn't do much any better, does it? If you could see, I can see it with my own eyes, but right here at the, uh, at the center of the arc, you can see that ultraviolet radiation and it's causing the glass to react with, uh, with a uh, faint purple glow. Here's some uranium glass that I keep around and you can see, I don't know if I can really capture it, but the uranium glass glows from that very small amount of ultraviolet radiation. If I took all the glassware off, you could better better see that uh, effect. But uh, when these arc lamps were in use uh, outside, you know, <laughs> you would get some psychedelic effects on fabric from the uh, ultraviolet radiation. And just to keep in mind, you know, anybody alive today, you're going to take for granted uh, reliable, inexpensive white light. Uh, when, when these arc lamps came out, you know, like I said, they were about two to three thousand dollars just for the lamp. You know, this was a luxury. Towns that had arc lighting were very, very rich. You know, you had to have money to install this stuff. And, you know, I've seen so many trade articles where these towns would get these arc lamps and people when they were first installed, people would just come in groups to watch, you know, just mobs of people to watch these lamps being turned on. It, it was a extreme luxury. You know, in an era of kerosene lamps and candles, and uh, if you were rich, gas lighting, you know, arc lamps were, were akin to having a food replicator in your kitchen. You know, it was just unheard of, and, and uh, most people, their first experience of electricity would have been an arc lamp. That would have been the first thing they see, they saw. Uh, I've, I've got a trade article where uh, out in Kansas, which is my home state, out in Kansas where I live, uh, one, one of the towns got an installation of four arc lamps, and after seeing it, some of the villagers thought it was a demonic force, and they got pitchforks and baseball bats, and and axes and cut the poles down because they thought that this was a devilish influence. You know, that that's just what this technology was during the time period. So I'll turn this thing off and turn it back on. You can kind of see that process one more time, how this thing starts up. The carbons on an AC lamp are both going to be equally warm and uh, the white hot carbons are what produce the majority of your light. So let this thing cool off and I'll fire it up again and shut up. So three, two, one. It's pretty cool. So I hope you enjoyed my video. And if you have any questions, I know I probably came off as a bit harsh. It just really upsets me when people destroy technology that has been around for 100 plus years. And uh, it was really my own fault. And I feel bad for not disclosing some of the risks with powering these things up without proper caution, cautionary measures. So if you have any questions, the uh, if you're on Facebook or message me on here, um, a, a lot of people are trying to restore parts and, uh, you know, making the, like, like, for example, these glass, these, uh, glass inner globes was a combined effort of, of several collectors and, uh, the molds for those things are, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars uh, and, uh, the outer globes are not as hard to find because, uh, most of them are standard sizes and you can find them online, but any of the metal parts, um, it, it just, it's, I don't have time. Uh, lighting is kind of one of my side hobbies. I, I do, uh, you know, car, car related work. That's my main hobby, but, uh, I did, just having the time and mainly the money. But, uh, a, a lot of people, uh, we, we have come together to reproduce some of these globe rings, which is something I'm working on. And if you need any parts, the, uh, Facebook carbon arc lamp buying, selling and restoration group, you know, get on that website, become a member ask questions. Uh, most likely, you know, somebody's out there doing it. So I hope you found this information useful. And I'm really sorry for this being almost a 30 minute video, but uh, 
without editing, editing it and being computer literate, it, it just is what it is. And it's, you know, somebody's making these videos. So I really appreciate you for taking the time. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I will direct you to the right person out there. So thank you so much. And until next time, bye-bye.